I'd like to know this morning if you've ever heard of the term gentrification. It's something that I've really only just become familiar with in the last few years. It's sort of a popular social concept that appears in a lot of political writing these days. The word was coined by a British sociologist named Ruth Glass in 1964 after she had observed a phenomenon that was happening where she lived. She takes this Britishism, gentry, which is a a word uh, describing those of noble or maybe upper class, and she describes the process of middle class liberal arts intelligentsia moving into her primarily working class London neighborhood. Now, the idea of that phenomena is that when a surge of well-off people begin to move into a poor neighborhood, what happens more often than not is that those that once lived there get priced out of their home. So that Nice things happen. Sometimes the areas can be rebuilt and new shops move in, but then rent goes up, and so people that were once living there now can't afford to live there anymore and, and have to move out. And that can be a serious social problem internationally. We kind of see this phenomenon happening all around the globe, and here even in the United States. And the tragic irony of this social phenomenon is that when some wealthy people move into a neighborhood, the idea we would naturally think is that, well, maybe they can bring their resources and help improve it for people that already live there. But really what happens more often is the needy can't afford to stay there and benefit. And so this is a problem that is being written about in many circles, not just here in the States, but around the world. In our passage today, I think we find a kind of ancient spiritual gentrification unfolding. Let me explain why. Because we have God's house. It is the temple in Jerusalem whose courtyard, we read especially in the other Gospels, is meant to be an open place of prayer for any and all who would come. It was for rich and poor alike. Even more extreme than that, it was for faithful Jews and for searching and questioning Gentiles. In God's house, there's room for everyone to come and pray, for everyone to meet this Lord. But when we come to His house today in our passage, we find that there's no room anymore. Why? Well, because price gougers and inflation exploiters are taking up the space that the worshipers are supposed to be in. But then along comes Jesus. Jesus who is gentle and lowly. Jesus who is meek and mild. And what does He do? The most surprising action He takes, I think, in any of the Gospel stories, He makes a whip of cords, He starts flipping over money tables. He drives out the merchants and all their merchandise in the vicinity all through a reddened face and gritted teeth. Jesus gets angry. Really, really angry. Why? It's because God is being separated from people. Something is interfering with sinners being able to come to their Savior. And that gets Jesus mad. The temple is proving at this point in history to be insufficient. An insufficient locale for God to live with humanity. And so Jesus pivots, we see in this passage, from cleansing the temple courtyard to talking about a different and coming temple. He's no longer talking about this old temple of brick and mortar that stays in one place. But he begins talking about a new and better temple. His body, his life, that is wherever sinners are. Jesus solves the problem of separation or of spiritual gentrification, we might say, by being God's presence with us wherever we are. 
But before we get there, let's kind of contextualize where uh, or why we're coming to this passage in the series that we're doing. Remember, we are walking through this Lenten season with Jesus. More accurately, though, we might say that Jesus is walking through Lent and through life with us. For example, when we experience the heights of joy and and, uh, the heights of joy of either new birth or, or baptism, we see that Jesus is already there. When we're wandering through one of life's many befuddling wildernesses, well, Jesus is already there too. And wouldn't you know it, when we deny ourselves and take up our cross in discipleship, well, Jesus is already there too. Jesus is proving this biblical truth over and over and over again. Indeed, God's place is with humanity. Wherever our humanity goes, we find that God is already there in the person of Jesus. And that brings us to our passage today. So we find Jesus traveling towards Jerusalem with his friends and his disciples to celebrate this wonderful occasion, the Feast of Tabernacles or Booths, as some called it, which culminates at the end of the the celebration in the celebration of Passover. Kent Hughes, the evangelical pastor, suggests that the, the spirit of anticipation that Jesus and his disciples and his family and all of the citizens of Israel are probably feeling is what we modern Christians feel like just a few days away from Christmas. I mean, the, our, our anticipations are high, families getting together, we're having feasts and celebrations and gift giving and all that stuff. There's lights and music and joy. That is exactly the kind of spirit that we're seeing here. It is the most wonderful time of the Jewish year. So that's what the background is. But we only get one verse of peace and joy and of celebration before all heaven breaks loose in the temple. Verse 14 says that Jesus walks into this temple, no doubt anticipating a wonderful time of celebration. And we read he found people selling oxen, sheep, and doves, and he also found the money changers sitting there. So let's use another Christian holiday to give us some needed context for this holy meltdown that Jesus is about to have. Now imagine, if you will, you are trying to get into our church's Good Friday service. It's a somber occasion. You come to remember the most sacred day in human history when Jesus in total agony died on the cross to free us from our sins. It's an important day. It's a wonderful day. It's also a horrible day. We have all the feelings of, of joy and, and relief, but all the feelings of sorrow and shame at the, the cost of our freedom. And so we come here to remember and to do that in a somber but hopeful way. So imagine you're trying to get in to the church, but out in that the porch area in the, in the foyer out there, you see crowds of people gathering. But there are people that are selling marshmallow peeps and painted eggs and colorful baskets. And then you see that there's a photo booth out there, and it's got the Easter bunny. And you see a bunch of adults you don't recognize shoving each other in line, trying to get their kids to the front so they can get their photo and go home. And then you see a whirring ATM machine in the corner, and then another one in the other corner, and you see baby chicks running all around, relieving themselves on the floor. And worst of all, the only way you as a worshiper can get in this sanctuary is if you pay a $100 entrance fee. Now you can understand why Jesus and his righteous indignation, and with white knuckles, fashions a whip of cords and begins cracking it at all these corrupt merchants and their despicable merchandise. They're taking a holy day where Israel remembers that God delivers them out of sin and death, and they are commercializing it. 
They are making it all about their bank accounts. How dare they, Jesus thinks. How dare they turn this house of prayer and repentance into a sleazy casino for robbers? How dare they take God's name in vain with this vile consumerism? How dare they? This band of extortionists we know from historical record would cheat poor pilgrims that have come from very far away to worship God. Well, they would come bringing their foreign coins and they would be offered an abysmal exchange rate. People coming to worship the Lord would be cheated out of their money by people that were religious and in good standing in the community. Then they'd have others that would sell doves and sheep that looked nice, but when the priests started looking them over, they'd find out were unclean and unacceptable offerings. And, by the way, no refunds issued, all sales final. By the way, there's some evidence too that maybe the crooked priests were in on this exchange. Maybe they would get a little bit, skim a little bit off the top of these merchants for allowing them to be in this place. Is there any wonder why Jesus is outraged at what's happening? He came to bless the poor in spirit, not to extort and rob them. And that is exactly what He finds. So the disciples with wide-eyed gaze watching their very mild-mannered Messiah and their rabbi, who who more often than not shows such humility that he would be around sinners. Well, now he is making some sort of makeshift whip and perhaps hitting people and turning over their tables and throwing coins in their face. I mean, it is chaos. But they remember, perhaps in this moment, maybe later, that stanza from Psalm 69 that says, zeal for your house, for your temple, will consume me. Jesus was quite literally eat up, we might say, with passion for the Father's glory, which is shown precisely in His setting up this home, this temple, in the midst of a bunch of sinners who need Him. That is what Jesus is passionate about. Showing the Father's grace for sinners. And when anybody messes with that reality, He is going to make it His business. I've thought about this a lot this week. Jesus is so insistent on God drawing close to sinners and mercy that when the world gets in the way with any of their schemes, philosophical, political, material, uh, monetary, he gets outraged. Christians in our society love to get outraged about a lot of things. But rarely do I find that most of us are outraged at the right kind of things. We get mad. We get mad at our little cultural squabbles and political differences. We get mad about some denominational trifles or some doctrinal minutia. Not the important things, but the small things. But the kind of anger that Jesus has here is for things that obscure God's grace for sufferers. That's what really makes him mad. When, it is, when, when sinners are not able to access God easily, that outrages Jesus. And for the most part, I don't think when most of us get angry, it has anything to do with that whatsoever. In fact, the kind of fake outrage that we see so common in our day and age is what we see in verse 18 here. Look at these religious onlookers. So the Jews replied to him after seeing his, what they would think is some kind of crazy temper tantrum. They say to him, what sign will you show us for doing these things? In other words, what is this all supposed, what is this supposed to signify for you wreaking havoc in this courtyard? Let's be careful, brothers and sisters. The voice of prim and proper evangelicalism I found many times can sound a lot like the religious 
naysayers of Jesus' day. Prove to us, Lord, your message with a sign. You've spoken clearly. You've acted clearly, but make it palatable for me and my perspective. So Jesus indeed offers them something of a sign. He offers His body. When He answers their snarky inquiry, He gives them a sign, all right. One that's so unbelievably true that not even His own disciples can really wrap their minds around it until much later in their lives. He says this, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it up in three days. Of course, they scoff at this. Verse 20 says, they say, three days? This second temple that we had to reconstruct after Solomon built his temple and and the Babylonians pulled it to the ground, this took 46 years to to make. And it still is not as beautiful as it was in Solomon's day. And yet you say you can rebuild it in three days? But John tells us what's really going on. Jesus isn't talking about the building. He's talking about His body. Now why is Jesus jumping to this sort of metaphor about the temple and and God's presence in His body? What exactly is happening here? Let's take a step back for a moment and remember with me what exactly this temple is supposed to be about from the get-go. When God gives Moses instructions on Mount Sinai about a tabernacle, which is kind of a mobile temple, (laughs) I'm hesitating it from calling a temple a trailer park temple. But that's essentially what it is. It's not a permanent place. It's meant to be uplifted and moved about wherever Israel goes in their wandering. But ultimately, that will be replaced in Solomon's day by a temple. But what is the significance? Why would God... God is the God of... He's the Creator. He's the God of the universe. In fact, He's above and beyond and outside of time and space and matter. Why would He need a house? Well, God doesn't need a house. But we need God to be with us. And so He builds a house so He can put Himself where we need Him to be, which is with us and for us. That's the point of the tabernacle. That's the point of the temple. It's where we see in the end of Exodus, it's where we see in, 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 in the, the story of the kings that His cloud of glory, His very presence comes down to live with His people. It's so powerful that we read in Exodus 40, I believe it is, that Moses can't even go into it. Moses, the prophet, the leader of the people, he's he's not even allowed to go into it. David's not even allowed to construct the temple. He has too much bloodshed, too much warfare in him, so only his son Solomon can do it. Again, it is not because people deserve to be with God, but because God in His grace wants to be with His people. When Israel was just a bunch of forgotten slaves, God rescued them from Egypt so that He could be with them. He could be their God and they could be His people. When they wandered in the wilderness, foolish and ungrateful as they were, wanting to go back to slavery, even when they were wandering for 40 years, God came and lived with them still in a tent, in a tabernacle. And when they got settled in the promised land, he raised up again Solomon, who had the power and wisdom that could lead the nation in building a temple where God's glorious presence could come and dwell permanently. And after resettling the land, after they were cut off from uh, Israel from exile, in exile, he raised up leaders like Ezra and Nehemiah that led people back to their land and and looked at the ruins of this temple and reconstructed it so that he could live with his scattered and battered people who were full of sin and sorrow just like we are. All throughout the Old Testament, God relentlessly comes to dwell with sinners whom He loves and forgives. (laughs) They never deserve it. And He always pursues it. That's the good news for us. That when we 
realize we truly do not deserve God's presence, nor His grace, nor His mercy, yet still it is of God's nature to relentlessly give it to us. So, when Paul tells us in Colossians 2.9, from a New Testament perspective, that in Jesus, the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily, we're starting to talk about temple language here. He's reminding us that Jesus is the true temple of God. Jesus is God's presence, His glory in a human body. Not a building. Not in a, not in a place, but in a person. In fact, I would argue now, I know this is, oh, I'm getting into dangerous waters now. But the land of Israel, the city of Jerusalem today, has given way to a better land and a better temple in Jesus. If a nuclear bomb was to blow Jerusalem off the map, God forbid, we would lose a lot of history, but we would not lose the promise of God. The land was always meant in the Old Testament to be a place where the Messiah would come to fruition in history. And He has come. So, those things have passed away, faded away. We have a better Sabbath. We have a better temple. We have a better nation. And it is with Jesus and His church. Again, very unpopular to say. When Jesus, uh, or rather, when John tells us exactly who Jesus is, he starts in chapter 1, verse 14, verse 14. He says, The Word. He is with God and He is God. He is eternal. He's everlasting. He's full of grace and truth. He is the Word, the Logos. That's who Jesus is. But in verse 14 of that chapter, he says, The Word, that is Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us. As English readers will miss out on the beauty of that word dwelt. The word dwelt literally means He dwelt in a tent. Jesus became flesh and tabernacled amongst us, full of grace and truth. See, that's what we need more than anything. Our New Testament reading reminds us of the problem that we're experiencing. This is from the Apostle Paul, by the way. It's not some you know, pedestrian saint. It's Paul! He's wasting away in his body of death and his own little tabernacle. He says, the desire for the desire to do what is good is with me, but there is no ability to do it. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but I practice the evil that I don't want to do. And he goes on before essentially exclaiming, What a wretched man that I am. Who will rescue me from this body, from this tabernacle, from this tent of death? Church, this is our problem. God wants to live with us because He loves us, but we, left to our sinful selves like Paul, do not want to live with God. And even when we do, because God has come into our hearts, God has moved into to our very being through the Spirit, bringing us Jesus and the glory of the Father with Him, even then we still struggle to really want Him to inhabit us. We want to turn His home for sinners into a hall for merchants. We want His tabernacle with us to be a temple for all our little pet philosophies or politicians or whatever. All this leads us to sin and death. So who indeed will rescue us from this body of death, hopelessly warped by sin as it is? Well, Paul gives us our answer. Thanks be to God, it's through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's not our religiosity. It's not our nationality. It's not our buildings. It's not our traditions. It's not our denominations. It's not even our doctrines that save us. It's Jesus Christ 
our Lord. Our tabernacle, our temple full of grace and truth. It's Jesus whose body, whose temple is broken for us that we may eat in remembrance of who He is. It's Jesus whose body, we read in verse 22, was raised from the dead so that we, now united to His body, where He is the head and we are His body through faith, now sealed in baptism, will also rise from the dead too. So church, the good news for you today is this. Despite the ongoing spiritual and physical gentrification happening in this world, despite the powers of sin and the devil doing their best to conquer humanity, despite things getting harder and more expensive and the world getting darker, despite how sad we get, how ill we are, how confused and scared and troubled we are, as the late great Presbyterian pastor Eugene Peterson said in his paraphrastic translation of John's Gospel. He said, God through Jesus has moved into our neighborhood. That's the good news. We may have the world trying to price us out to drive us to despair, but God has moved into our house with us. He hasn't pushed us out. He's taken us in. And wherever this life takes us, whatever place we lay our head in the evening, whatever our home looks like, whatever our jobs look like, wherever we come to worship, God will be there with us in Jesus Christ. He is our head and we are His body. And now this table, His body, this temple is for you. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your servant Jesus Christ whom You have raised from the dead, so that in Him we will rise too. By Your Spirit, free us from this body of death and deliver us to a new and everlasting life. For we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.